Now let's talk about some examples of marine protected areas from around the world. As we talk about global MPAs, much of the conversation in recent years has been about so-called large scale marine protected areas. And so this is different than the historic uh, MPAs that we've been used to where marine protected areas are, are more typically small on average. Um, these these so-called large-scale MPAs are by definition areas that are larger than 150,000 square kilometers. This is a very different beast than the traditions. I have a little figure on the, the mid-right uh, right here just to give you a sense of the, the acreage change over time. Um, basically 150,000 square kilometers is roughly a little bit less than 390 by 390 kilometers or roughly um, one of those sides of that square would be about Malibu to about Monterey, California, and from the coast to, um, to West, uh, California coast to western Nevada. So it's a large area. If we were to talk about um, a large-scale MPA that's over a, that, that is 150,000 square kilometers, that would be about 40% of the land area of California. Um, we've we have uh, 22 marine protected areas that are this large across the globe um, as of uh, 2023. And then uh, another trend in the last, mostly last 20 years or so, um, has, has spurred up. And that is uh, to not even have just large scale MPAs, but have these massive scale uh, marine protected areas. Things that are over a million square kilometers. Now, for comparison... An MPA that's a million square kilometers is about the land area of California plus Oregon plus Washington plus Nevada. I mean, it's a huge area. Um, we currently have six MPAs that that cross that thousand uh, excuse me that cross that million square kilometer threshold. Four of which are are fully or really rigorously protective um, uh, as as of 2023. Um, this whole era of really large-scale marine protected areas really got going in 1975 with the first um, uh, iteration of the uh, Great Barrier Reef off Australia's northern coast um, and then would be uh, slightly uh, increased in, in the codification in 1981. But 1975 really starts this large scale. Uh, fundamentally, you need to understand that it is it is an incredibly daunting challenge to try to manage a marine protected area that's the size of you know four states in in the U.S. Um, the deep challenges are, are myriad, and we could spend hours talking about that. But in sh in summary, how do you enforce that when you when you're going over thousands of you know miles or what have you? Um, how do you monitor the health of such a large area? There's always going to be some parts that are kicking butt. There's always going to be some parts that are hurting. So how do we monitor that? How do we find the financing, the money to provide the resources, both in enforcement and in, in response and in you know, emergency um, restorations and, and, and whatever it is? Huge challenge. And then fundamentally, by definition, when we get this large, we're talking transboundary issues. So, so across potentially multiple countries or across multiple um, areas of the globe. And, and that those different boundaries that we cross add uh, great complexity to managing it. So those are large scale marine protected areas. Here's um, a relatively recent map as to uh, some of these. And so the the blue, the light blue here is the exclusive economic zone of, of uh, you know, a particular country. And then the red is, um, as of a few years ago, uh, some of these large scale marine protected areas. So you see that the Western Pacific is really enriched. And that's where, while these can be, these are in all oceans, that, that's really where the, the lion's share of, um, of these management structures are located. Um, now here is where we are. So these are the top 10. Uh, now these are for, these are not all the marine protected areas. These are ones that have strong or potentially strong protections for them. So I've left off a few here. So these are only the ones that maybe are really, um, you know, manifesting some, some, some true uh, management heft here, at least so far. And so I have the top 10 listed as of right now. Um, the name of the um, marine protected area and then the country um, so they're all associated with a country, um, with the exception of the Ross Sea. That's in Antarctica. That surrounds Antarctica, and uh, that is um, by, Antar by the Antarctic Treaty. That is, uh, you know, a shared 
um, shared heritage for the world's people. So that, that one's a bit uh, funky. The Australians and New Zealands have been the leaders in, in establishing this marine protected area. But all the other ones are associated with a country. Then I have the approximate size in terms of millions of square kilometers. You can get a sense there for how big things are. And then of that area that's designated, so of the Ross Sea region, MPA, what proportion or what percentage of that MPA is in full or highly, has full protection or high levels of protection from uh, exploitation? Uh, basically here, we're, we're usually talking about fishing and, and fishing management. Uh, so most of them you see that are, are pretty much complete closures, at least to commercial fishing. Uh, and then on the right column here, the last column is the proportion of all the global marine protected areas that, um, uh, you know, have all of, uh, the, if we look at all the areas across the globe, this is the fraction of the, gl uh, of the share of the full or high level of protection um, that we have planet wide. And so you see the Ross Sea, op you know, contributes a huge chunk to our global um, uh, uh, highly enforced or at least theoretically highly enforced standards for um, behavior within a marine protected area. When we add all these guys up, this uh, the, the right column, that adds up to about 76.7% of all the planets um, full protection or highly protective uh, marine protected area extent. So this is these 10 pretty much make up the, the vast uh, majority of our uh, closure areas and our, and our strict restrictions um, in terms of global MPAs. All right, next I want to talk about some examples of marine protected areas. The first one is uh, the one that we've already uh, touched on, but this is uh, the, uh, the marine protected area that I did um, spent a lot of my time as an undergrad in, then did my PhD in. This is off of the Two Harbor area of Two Harbors area of Catalina Island. And it is uh, adjacent to the Wrigley Marine, um, the, the Wrigley Marine Research Center. Um, it, the name has changed over the years, uh, but basically um, USC's Marine Lab. And it began way back when in 1965, not really as a, as a legal definition, but just enforced because it was so close to the Marine Lab. So right where I've drawn the red line, which is the extent of the MPA, it's very close to shore, it hugs the shoreline. Just over that first hill, just over this area right here, is the Marine Lab. It sits just behind here. And so that <clears throat> that area is where um, the, the you know researchers, employees, et cetera, work. And it was relatively easy to just walk over the hill and see somebody anchoring, say, near where someone's doing an experiment and say, hey, bud, move, move your boat to the next bay over or something. Uh, it got it got de facto reserve status, marine protected area status, in 1988, and has remained that way ever since. It's a total of 13 hectares, so it's very small, and um, it is uh, primarily used for uh, conducting research, monitoring, etc., of the kelp forest environment here in Southern California. So this is this is sort of you know the classic small scale, um, a, a, a micro, if you will, uh, marine protected area. Let's, look, let's turn to some of those large scale marine protected areas that we've mentioned that are in the Pacific. First one I wanna talk about is the so-called Natural Park of the Coral Sea in New Caledonia. New Caledonia is about 1500 kilometers uh, east of Australia. It's a French territory. The French have controlled it since the mid 1800s. It has um, a much greater degree of autonomy, although still you know, still controlled by the French, but but a much higher degree of autonomy since 1999. Um, it's essentially this is essentially like a commonwealth with with the British uh, that that type of uh, association. Large number of people live there, 270,000 people. The economy itself, which might be surprising to people that haven't heard of New Caledonia, is larger than New Zealand. Um, and uh, so starting around w when they got autonomy, there was a lot of interest in, in taking a different approach to marine uh, management. And there was a lot of local will and there was a lot of international expertise through groups like Conservation International, etc. Some of these big international NGOs uh, that came together. Um, formally, the planning began in 2012. Um, uh, fostered, helped along by the Pacific Islands Forum, which is a group of, um, of the Pacific Island nations that uh, get together and talk and strategize and try to support each other. 
with different policies. Uh, and by April 2014, they uh, formally um, declare this, this marine protected area at about, uh, about 1.3 um, uh, uh, million square kilometers. And just the creation of this one area alone, since it, can, it counts towards uh, France's total number, it boosted France's MPA, uh, water is in, it, it, the, the French control, from 4% to 16%, so a huge boost. The question, as with many of these um, uh, types of marine protected areas, is are we, getting, are, are we getting ahead of our skis? Are we getting too far ahead? In the original declaration, they said the MPA is the full extent of the exclusive economic zone of New Caledonia. But they gave themselves uh, three years to figure out the details. <laughs> so they said, Here, here's our marine protected area. What it does, we don't know yet. Um, and this, again, is a, is a not unusual pattern. And so the question comes up, is this really a, a paper park? People have talked about this being a sister site to the Cook Islands Marine Park, what we called the Cook Islands Marine Park at the time, and now it's a different name. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and the idea here was that we're going to lose some revenue from fishing licenses, primarily from um, offshore tuna fishing. Um, but we will more than recover the economic loss from that by um, uh, having a lot of you know, fantastic ecotourism. That is sort of at the heart of some of the challenges and some of the, the worries about uh, paper parkness of this, of this particular um, area. It includes things like allowing tour boats or excuse me, cruise ships to come into protected lagoons. And, and there's just a huge controversy here about, about what is actually enforced and what is actually um, a, a change in terms of behavior. And I'll just leave that for now for saying so that so, that, so that, that's one example of an MPA. Here's another one. This is uh, so-called PIPA or the Phoenix Island Protected Area. This is um, uh, in the waters of the Republic of Kiribati. And again, as a quick note, it looks like Kiribati, but it's pronounced Kiribati. And this was uh, first established in 2008, became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2010. It's about uh, 400,000 square kilometers and is one of the classic so-called big ocean jewels. So big ocean is a group that um, has formed to help support and, and facilitate these types of large scale MPAs. This is one of their um, you know, earliest big jewels. This was essentially, this, ha this is a collaboration between the New England Aquarium, Conservation International, and uh, the Kiribati people. And so the idea here is to uh, shut, and this was, you know, as, as originally proposed, this is a complete shutdown of commercial fishing. Local folks can fish in their lagoons and adjacent to their, uh, you know, reefs, et cetera, as they traditionally always have. But the large scale, large bodied uh, uh, tunas and billfish, things of that nature, moving through these waters that have historically been harvested would no longer be harvested. And this was a huge cause celeb and supposedly the kind of thing that we want. Um, this rapidly became a bully pulpit for Kiribati to talk about all manner of things, in particular climate change. And the idea here was that um, this was a this was a lot of news coverage. This was you know the biggest, the brightest, the 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 most dramatic. And we see this over and over again that when these large scale MPAs are declared, they of course bring a lot of attention. And with that attention, some people. Um, obviously, uh, want to keep that attention for um, for coastal management, marine management, but also other things as well. And so, in this case, it was a platform to for the uh, president of Kiribati to talk about how stressed the coral reefs are, the general problem of overfishing, and uh, this was really touted by especially the NGO community as a way of using MPAs as a tool. Um, for the developing world as well as the developed world, for the global south as well as for the global north. Uh, most of the research, most of the theory, most of all that stuff has been developed in the global north. This was an opportunity for, for folks in the global south to start um, weighing in and playing with the big boys, as it were. Um, uh, this is also, uh, th this bully pulpit was also uh, frequently used to talk about climate change, as I mentioned and the fear that the Kiribati will uh, have something like 94,000 environmental refugees in the next century or potentially much sooner. And so how the, this MPA is played into that is with, here's a quote from the president saying that, you know, this MPA is a significant contribution to the world community in the hope that they would also act to deal with, um, for example, uh, managing climate emissions and to better fund adaptation 
for places like the Kiribati. And um, the then president, no longer president, but the then president of the Kiribati, uh, um, uh, president tong uh, basically was lauded as an environmental hero and and all this kind of stuff and, and everybody said how great things were so he's used as a fundraiser for all kinds of groups um, but there's indications this may be um, more of a paper park um, so uh, fairly soon uh, after the announcements were made there were questions as to what was how how would stuff really be enforced and and will we really um, you know engage in shutting down uh, fish, fishing um, and to respond to the critics, that actually seems to have happened. So we shut down at least a lot of the legal fishing in this area. But, um, you know, again, flying the paper park flag and, and, and the worry here, um, we, we stopped commercial fishing in 2014, but um, this is also getting sucked in, as so many of these things are, into the global po geopolitical conversation. So, so the Kiribati had suspended uh, diplomatic ties with China um, uh, previously. But um, starting in 2019, they reestablished diplomatic um, uh, ties with China. And China began to uh, try to have more influence in uh, Kiribati, as they do in many parts of the world, very quietly, not trying to raise a lot of attention. And they did things, amongst other th examples, of giving $4.2 million, uh, donated $4.2 million in the lead up to the 2021 uh, presidential elections. And they've shown strong, so they're, they're strongly interested in being able to fish again, right? China's a big tuna fish, fishing power. So they really, really want to fish again in, the, in those waters. Um, but they're also, separate from coastal management, um, they're also interested in rebuilding an old airstrip on an island uh, in the Kiribati uh, called Canton that was an airstrip built in World War II by the U.S. and then abandoned. That's a whole conversation, but... But uh, they would that that would that would give the Chinese access to an airstrip much closer to U.S. territory. There's all kinds of international treaties that might have a, 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 a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and the Kiribati that might uh, make that hard. But nevertheless, th there, there's all this kind of geopolitical jockeying going on. Clearly, um, a new government was elected, and in November of 2021, that new cabinet, that new presidential cabinet voted to issue a new tuna fishing contract. So basically they said, um, actually we wanna go back to fishing in this MPA. Um, uh, where we, so where we are is uh, when the protected area was created um, uh, between Conservation International, the New England Aquarium, the Kiribati people, they set up a, a PIPA trust. And that trust makes annual payments to the government of the Kiribati to um, so they can you know essentially offset the losses of some of the tuna licensing fees that they would collect from commercial fishermen that would be fishing in their water otherwise. The claim is that since so this is the claim of the current government of the Kiribati that um, since it's no longer um, a fishable area, the pe people's supposed interest in the area has declined. It's unclear where those numbers come from, but that's what they say. They also say that by opening up commercial fishing, they would generate on the order of $200 million a year in new um, revenues. Um, suffice it to say, that seems to be extremely optimistic and uh, very unlikely to, for a whole variety of reasons, to actually be manifest, even if they do start selling contracts. Um, and in the immediate wake of that, the, this you know generated a lot of press. And, and um, the, the new president said... Um, quote, our decision as a sovereign country and government is people-centric and commensurate with holistic options for marine protection and management, economic diversification, sustainable tourism and fisheries uh, to promote the growth of Kiribati's blue economy and uplift the lives of all the Kirib Kiribati people. Um, the no longer president, the former president, President Tong, said that, you know, when this happened, it's a huge blow for conservation, but I think it's a much bigger blow to our credibility as a nation. And then uh, Peter Shelley, who, who manages, who basically runs the, the PIPA Trust, said the ability for any people to have confidence in working with Kiribati like this in the future is going to be really diminished. And that's a real shame because there are very important partnerships that could be developed with Kiribati that have PIPA as the centerpiece. 
Um, so where we stand is uh, it's we're sort of in limbo. So since late 2021, this has been sort of a political football going back and forth. Not everybody in government agrees. So the president's office wants this to happen. But other elements, environment minister, et cetera, they're not interested. So this is, is this is going back and forth. There's still pressure to allow commercial fishing, but it hasn't officially happened yet. Other uh, examples, though, of of apparent Chinese influence seem to be the fact that in July, the following year, in July 2022, um, Kiribati pulled out of the Pacific Island Forum, which is a collaborative area for, um, as I mentioned, for, um, you know, uh, those folks to uh, get together and and strategize and support one another. So there's there's ish, there, 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 this seems to be the classic case of uh, a wedge issue in trying to to drive people into one camp or another um, by China. Okay, next example, let's talk about the Cook Islands, what used to be called the Cook Islands Marine Park. And this is when, again, this is us visiting. There's Dr. Steele um, uh, visiting um, with some of our previous trips and when we took our class to the Cook Islands. Um, uh, and, and, and again, this is, this is their, this was, we were there um, in the planning stages. And so, so the Cook Islands are 15 widely dispersed islands in the South Pacific. Relatively small chunk of land. But a huge amount, because the islands are so distant from each other and, and the 200 nautical mile EEZ bubble around each of the islands translates into about 2 uh, million square kilometers in terms of their EEZ. So it's the 20th largest um, EEZ in the world just by absolute water controlled, but the fourth largest by ratio in terms of uh, how much uh, land to how much water uh, the, the country controls. The Cook Islands are in a, a funky situation. They're in a so-called free association with New Zealand. So they um, achieved self-rule um, from the, the British and the Australians and New Zealand, all that kind of stuff, in 1965. But they're, but they're so-called in a free association with New Zealand. And so what that means is um, the Cook Islands has their own parliament. They elect their own people to parliament. But they also have representation in the New Zealand parliament. And... Um, the, so, you know, they, the Cook Islands people send their own athletes to the, you know, to the uh, Olympics and that kind of stuff. But this free association uh, gives them some benefits. And so they, um, uh, for example, the, the New Zealand Navy can patrol and, and enforce uh, law, maritime laws around uh, the Cook Islands. They don't do it every single day, but, but there's that, that option. Um, uh, the, perhaps the biggest aspect of this free association, it means that everybody born in the Cook Islands has a Cook Islands passport and a New Zealand passport. And so what that means is um, th that that's translated into a, a huge a, a people drain, brain drain for a lot of the younger folks because there, there aren't as many economic opportunities in the Cook Islands as we see in many places of the world, many of our rural areas. And so because they have that passport, they can jump on a plane. When they turn 18, finish, they have a great uh, school system. They graduate from high school, jump on an airplane, go to New Zealand, visit their aunties or uncles for you know a couple days, and then jump on a plane and go to Australia because Australia and New Zealand have, have you know free travel between their borders. And so you can jump on a plane, go there, and go work in Australia, many of the young Cook Islanders have gone into the mining industry in northern Australia where they stay and, you know, will be there for, you know, maybe a few decades, make a bunch of money. And then we'll, when retire, they come back to the Cook Islands. And this has caused all kinds of interesting uh, challenges because people there, uh, people that you know are in Australia are used to, you know, government with all these services and, and rapid response when there's a problem and this and that. And they move back to their their um, traditional island, and, and there, are, there are sometimes some conflicts. Um, uh, regardless, the Cook Islands has very strong cultural traditions and values. They still have a strong uh, a, a tribal a network. Um, uh, some of our um, uh, colleagues have, have researched some of the power structures uh, there and, and how, how traditions are passed on really fantastic uh, education system. There's, there's a lot of neat things going on in the Cook Islands, and they've main, maintained many of their strong cultural traditions, especially dance and things of that nature, whereas some other small island nations have, have uh, lost more of that uh, traditional culture. Um, their culture now, the Cook Islands used to do a lot of growing in agriculture, but pretty much today it's a, it's a tourism-centric economy, primarily to three islands, um, the, the, the Rarotonga, the, the capital, and then Aitutaki are the biggest, um, are, are the most popular ones. 
um, and it's only they're only a three hour flight from New Zealand, so from Auckland. So it's it's really um, convenient for uh, folks to get there. They speak English, so it's it's not like some other countries where you have to know Spanish or French or something of that nature. Um, the other aspects of the, the stuff that's not tourism, they do do pelagic fishing, um, and they do have some minimum tropical uh, fruit growing for things like star fruit and stuff. And they have there's some a bit of offshore banking that goes on there, but pretty much it's a tourism centric economy. So these folks are trying to figure out how can we, you know, build, you know, make a healthy um, economy and a healthy environment and, and a source of, of keeping our young people here and all this and that. So in 2012, they announced that, as with all many of these things, something will exist. We're going to create an MPA. We don't know what it is. Uh, uh, now, the, the Cook Islands has um, essentially in a cost cutting measure when they were having some some funding problems, they've essentially outsourced their Department of the Environment. So um, that TIS is referring to an NGO, which is, everybody refers to them as TIS, is, is an NGO which um, does a lot of the work. So when the government wants to do something about, say, deep sea mining or fishing or whatever, they might uh, um, contract with TIS to do some of the scoping uh, documents and, and, and the like that would maybe traditionally be done by in-house a government uh, agency. Um, and so, so TIS and Oceans 5, which is another international NGO uh, group with Conservation International, et cetera, um, were drafting plans and, uh, in, in 2012. And so they said, maybe we'll, we'll do the, the MPA 50 miles out. or So in other words, um, leave a buffer the first 50 miles so local islanders can still do their traditional fishing um, and not be restricted in any way, shape, or form, what have you. And so there, there was uh, you know, a couple years where where there were various maps like these uh, put out and, and suggested as to maybe where things might go. Um, and a lot of worry about um, politics involved here and who's funding this and, and how's it going to work and, and who's, who's you know, dictatorially saying we're going to do this or that. So, so a lot of political controversy around the establishment. Um, now we, so now the um, protected area is Mary Moana. It is a has been it's formally been established. It was designated in 2017, and it's a multiple use MPA, meaning we can do different things inside. It's not necessarily a 100% closure in all the waters. It's 1.9 million square kilometers, and its goal is to conserve the ecological biodiversity and heritage values of the Cook Islands marine environment. Um, it it is a, a bit different than the traditional approaches. So the traditional approaches in the Cook Islands, and indeed lots of Polynesia, um, is uh, um, a you know, long-term uh, uh, approach that's worked for centuries and centuries, uh, driven by um, the regent of the area, the king or the queen. And so in the Cook Islands, this, this Polynesian version is called a Rawai, uh, and it was a tr it's a tradition of natural resource management, and generally, it's a ban on the harvest of a resource or access to a particular area. And it can be applied to anything. It can be applied to fruit trees, it can be applied to crops, it can be applied to species, um, uh, uh, marine species. Um, or it can be applied to all fishing, like in a lagoon or an area off of a beach, something of that nature. Uh, the, the chief generally uh, declares it. And um, if it's in the sea, they historically been used to build up fish populations for on the order of about nine months to two years, and then it's lifted. So it's not a permanent thing. Um, the other the other flavor, which isn't as common, um, would be uh, a permanent protection that w wouldn't it wouldn't be up to the the chief. It would just sort of go in perpetuity. Um, Whereas what we typically have in, in the West, right, what we're talking about, when we say marine protected area, we're talking typically about a large area of the sea that um, is protected sometimes for recreational uses, sometimes nothing is allowed, but basically protected for all these recreational uses, um, but really has a specific conservation goal in mind. Uh, and the most classic one is restricting fishing or restricting oil exploration, right? So, so um, the traditional approach is, hey, we're going to do this till we see the, the resource respond. And then we'll we'll lift it. That's not really what um, modern MPAs are like. They're they're like we're going to declare this, and this is going to be the state for the foreseeable future. As of 2023, we're still in the planning phase of 20. So again, the marine protected area is declared in 2017, but we're still in the planning phase. And only in April of 2023 did the technical advisory group 
for, were they named by the by the government as to who was going to be on that committee? So we didn't even have a technical advisory group. And then uh, they met for the first time uh, in two years to begin to develop a work plan, right? So this was not to to create the exact rules or exact borders or whatever, but was to create a, a group to start to work on what those would be. Um, key to this, the first step, the major step they're going to do is so-called marine spatial planning. Now, we've not talked about this. Marine spatial planning is basically GIS or, or zoning for the ocean. And so this is uh, where we pull in various stakeholder uses and we try to spatially explicitly manage, uh, you know, conflicting needs and, and protections and all that kind of stuff. Marine spatial planning is, is totally important, very essential for a lot of our coastal management. But I would suggest that marine spatial planning, while necessary and helpful for good management, isn't management. Just simply making a map doesn't translate into um, enforcement, into funding, and all that kind of stuff. And so, so again, the Cook Islands uh, Marine Protected Area is really at this stage where they're, they're, they're working on the marine spatial planning piece. Okay, uh, some other examples uh, closer to home. This would be uh, Florida's deep coral reefs. And these are our oculina reefs. So that's where we're talking about. We're off the east coast of Florida. Um, and these, and the species in particular is oculina varicosa or the so-called ivory tree coral. Now these are deep corals. Um, so these are not like the guys in one meter of water that are, you know, rainbow colored and all that kind of stuff with Nemo floating, running through them. Um, these are a, a very delicate branching stony coral. Any one head can easily be over a century old. So they're slow growing. Um, and they form these very deep water reefs. So by deep water, we're talking, you know, 10 to 30 meters down deep. And again, this part of the country has relatively shallow waters close to close to shore. So, so these um, and very sandy. And so these high relief areas, these high relief coral reefs, are really really important uh, habitat for species that um, need these types of things. So they form pinnacles, they form ridges. Um, and, and they form a, a loose chain running about 170 kilometers from roughly Daytona Beach to Fort Pierce. And um, uh, some of them can be quite deep, right? So, so while, the, while the, the relief on the individual um, reef is, is, is 10 meters to 30 meters in sort of height from the lowest point to the highest point, where they're located, um, you know, the bottom of the ocean there is quite deep. So that's like 70 to 100 meters deep. Um, and um, they sometimes form monospecific reefs with only this one, in terms of the coral species, with only this one coral species um, creating all of, the, all of the substrate for these areas. Overall, these aggregate, it said like one little you know, you know, head could easily be 100 years old or a century old. Um, the overall reefs are easily tens of thousands of years old. Um, so the, these, these are biogenic structures long lived. Um, and these coral heads, it turns out that they're valuable, um, a valuable space for invertebrates and for fish. And just a few examples here of the really um, uh, highly valued fish species are gag grouper, red grouper, red porgy, uh, all really desirous critters. This is what the oculina coral looks like if, you're, uh, if you hold it in your hand here. Um, but, and then on the right is a description from the late 1800s and a, a il hand-drawn illustration from the late 1800s. Um, but more typically, what we see if we were to go down there today is the thing on the left, and that would actually be a pretty big piece. And so if, if we look closely on that thing on the left, all that sort of tangly spider web, um, uh, candy, uh, uh, cotton candy kind of stuff around it, that's not algae. That's actually, those are actually fishing lines. So these areas have been heavily impacted by people. Um, uh, and uh, both by trawling, shrimp trawlers, but also by just like you saw there, fishing, regular uh, fishing line. And uh, in the 60s and 70s, this was a really popular place to go get those, for example, those three targeted, um, uh, highly desirous uh, fish species that just love to hang out here. So fishermen knew very quickly, hey, if you want to go catch these big groupers, go out to you know, this area offshore. Sci so the fishermen figured out very fast, as always happens. Uh, the scientists were, as usually happens, slower to, the, uh, slower to figuring out what was going on. And so in 1975, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution, which is a, a, a local, fantastic local um, uh, sort of version of Scripps or Woods Hole type of thing, right? Um, so Harbor Branch went out 
and um, they they were hearing all this stuff about hey these guys are getting all these great fish so they went out and they they looked down deep and they actually first robustly rigorously described these oculina beds um, and uh, and they were worried even back then they were they were hammered and so um, so uh, some of the scientists got together in particular John Reed petitioned the National Marine Fishery Service and the uh, South Atlantic uh, Fisheries Management Council, which we've not talked about yet, but which we will when we get to fisheries, um, uh, have, has uh, you know made a petition that, hey, we should, we should not be fishing here. We should protect these beds. And after a few years, um, they declare uh, a small subset of the total area, 240 square kilometers, as a so-called habitat area of particular concern, or HAPC. Um, and so then, there, then more research is done, and by 1991, um, some of the more rigorous surveys, d uh, deep submersible surveys and stuff go on, and we find that about 90% of the coral is just rubble. It's broken into pieces. It's little little chunks the size of your finger. It's not intact coral heads. And they see, even though the at this point the the fishery closure on on this area had uh, been going on for several years, there was basically zero signs of any type of recovery. Um, with that, armed with that information, a few years later, that HAPC becomes the Experimental Oculina Research Reserve, or the EORR, and that was a no-take area. So it didn't just limit some of the types of activities, the trawling, etc. It was like, you can't do any fishing over this area. And then in the wake of that, that we, we, some researchers start the first experiments to see if we can help jumpstart the coral recovery, some coral restoration experiments. Um, by 1996, additional restrictions come in and we ban all anchoring. So even if you don't fish, just dropping an anchor could physically damage, uh, you know, these areas. So we ban anchoring then. Um, uh, in 1988, again, this is more for our conversation when we get to fisheries management, but it's the whole area is des designated as an essential fish habitat, which is additional protections. Um, in 2000, the area is expanded to just over 1,000 square kilometers of, of where you can't, can't do fishing, etc., um, it's re-upped in 2004. There were some efforts to maybe get rid of it, but it's re-upped in 2004. And then not a whole lot happens until about uh, the, until the election of President Trump and his administration, which was really pro-fishing and trying to reduce all uh, manner of constraints on, on harvesting and all those types of things. And so basically started in 2020 um, and uh, and it comes to a formal proposal in 2021 where the Trump administration proposes allowing fish uh, shrimp trawling, excuse me, back into the reserve or at least right up to the edge of the reserve, which because you can't always exactly position your, your trawling would mean that there would be in all likelihood trawling inside the reserve. However, it was however it was uh, played out. That that engendered a, a big national uh, push. Um, by environmental groups and conservation groups. And um, that uh, led to NOAA formally declining that proposal to open the area to more fishing uh, and, and to reopen it specifically to bottom trawling. So things have pretty much stayed the same in terms of uh, what is permitted inside. Um, again, uh, this, is, this is, we see very few signs of recovery. Um, this is what, uh, from an area that wasn't heavily impacted back in the day, this is what we'd expect to see if this area was, was healthy. We'd see these large grouper aggregations around these intact coral heads. You'd see crabs and fish. So, the, the, so those fish, those grouper are coming in both to, to get food in some cases, but also just to sort of find re refuge, right? So the, the value of heterogeneity um, is, is quite profound, both for, for, you know, for all manner of activities that these organisms want to do. Uh, this is what the area looks like in the impacted zones, which is the vast majority of the area, right? So you see just you see very low fish diversity. You don't see anything like the size of the fish we saw. You see very few crabs, and there's not a lot of nooks and crannies for guys to get in there and, and do their do their do. So this is some old ROV footage um, from what the area looked like. So these are from the, some of those initial surveys in the 1970s. Um, from uh, some of the less impacted areas. Um, and this is, this is again before, before we had the intense trawling and things uh, halted. And so, you know, a lot of big fish.
Okay, so this is, you guys get the point. You guys get the idea here in terms of uh, what's going on. Okay, so you guys got the idea of what it looks like down there. Um, again, uh, fishing, the fishing line wraps, anchors break. Um, and uh, one of the most destructive practices we have over hard bottoms, over, over, over um, reefs and things like that, is bottom trawling. It's a really bad practice. That said, trawling itself is not necessarily a bad practice. Trawling over soft bottoms, sand, mud, that's usually not much of a problem and, 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 a relative, and, and can be a relatively minimally impactful uh, fishing practice in shallow waters. So I don't want to, uh, what's happened in the past is sometimes all trawling, all bottom trawling has gotten a bad name. And it's really just the areas that we're, we're dragging over um, habitat that can be ripped up. So seagrass beds or rocky reefs, that kind of stuff. All right, so uh, the efforts to try to recover oculina, as I mentioned before, um, were, were varied, have been varied. Um, we first deployed so-called reef ball clusters, um, which is what you see on the right, right there. And this is essentially a cement <coughs> orb that we um, blow up a, a ball inside and then pour concrete and then pop the ball and cut some holes. And the idea there is to try to jumpstart habitat. So to make it such that uh, there's places for some of those big fish to come in and take refuge, physically take refuge. I mean, I get all the food resources, the prey availability, but at least I get some of the shelter benefits of structure. Um, and then either, you know, glue fragments of coral onto that uh, structure or, or not. Um, but suffice it to say, that hasn't really worked. So they do seem to work as so-called fish aggregating devices because fish like structure uh, when they don't have a lot of structure. Um, but basically, this stuff still hasn't worked. Um, and and uh, we, we are not able to jumpstart the rest. We, we've not to date been able to jumpstart the coral restoration here. And this is another example of when we let the fishery, when we let the resource be degraded, be degraded so much and then put an MPA at the end, that's not enough. That's, that's not, a, MPAs aren't a magical tool that are going to save everything, right? If we've destroyed the resource, just throwing an MPA on it's not going to do much. And that unfortunately seems to be what's going on with our oculina reefs. Let's take another example at, at another type of uh, coastal marine protected area. Let's look at some of our estuaries. In this case, we'll look at the South Slough National Estuary Estuarine Research Reserve up in Oregon, up in Coos Bay, Oregon. The story here, the management issue here is uh, uh, salmon, salmon, salmon. So we're talking about these fish that spend part of their lives in freshwater, part of their lives in seawater. Um, and so uh, in the case of what we'll just mention here briefly, uh, they, they, they transition through the estuary uh, context, either going or coming from the rivers. By the, in this particular area, in the 1970s, almost 80, more than 80% of the historic salt marsh was gone, destroyed. Um, uh, local citizens realized what was going on, got a little angry and started lobbying and basically uh, through the newly established Coastal Zone Management Act, which we'll also talk about later, um, uh, decided to let's make a reserve here, right? And so the very first version was only 19 square kilometers. Um, and that only of that, that was only 2.4 square kilometers were um, the primary um, salt marsh <clears throat> area habitats that are used by salmon. So again, starting with the very small as, as, the, as the example. This is where we're looking. So we're on the sort of southern half of Oregon, Coos Bay, and, uh, and, and the map here is where the uh, reserve is. This is what it looks like if you were to go there and just, you know, very beautiful coast, rugged coast, uh, you know, classic Pacific Northwest type of coast. And then we have these, you know, freshwater sources going into the ocean. Um, uh, before the 1900s, this area was just a natural salt marsh with regular water flowing in, all that kind of good stuff. We started messing with the system in the early 1900s where we started diking those rivers and, uh, and cutting off the floodplain from inundation. And this is uh, primarily uh, so that we could do agriculture or graze cattle in those areas next to the river. Um, and then we you know, just continued to mess with, we, we love to mess with fresh water in our society. We just, we can't stand a free flowing river. It seems to bother people and we must manipulate it. So by the night, you know, result of this and all these other things, by the 1980s, we're seeing significantly reduced coho salmon runs in the in the rivers there. Um, and by the 1990s, wild coho coho salmon 
are basically uh, not coming back. And the only ones that we have in the river are ones that we're rearing in um, fish hatcheries and releasing. Uh, and so that spurs action, mid-90s, the, this Tidelands restoration project, which had a couple phases, and we'll just talk about them very briefly. Uh, one is the Coons Marsh and Cox Canyon Marsh restoration, and then a phase two uh, were, were other areas of the creeks. And so the basic idea here was, in this case, the, the focus in this uh, protected area was to remove an existing stressor. So the other things we've talked about, are we were talking about removing fishing, you know, and sort of an active thing. In this case, we're talking about removing a legacy uh, management action that is still sticking around. In the case of these essentially dams, but whereas a dam goes across the creek, dikes are on the sides. So these are essentially dams that parallel the river. And so the plan is, hey, let's knock down these dams and allow the um, river to innervate these areas as it historically did. And in that innervation, creating all these little small areas where there's spiders and, and insects and crustaceans can live. And then when the baby salmon go up there, they can eat those and all that kind of good stuff and all the ecosystem functioning we're talking about. And so this is what uh, the Coons Mars looked like before the restoration started. So, so that upper graph right here this is this is all essentially this has historically been cut off there's a you can't quite tell but there's a big there's a big um, uh, dike right here so it's hard for the river waters to flood here and so um, and then here's after the the first bit of the restoration and so we've taken out we've lowered the elevation so now the water can more easily flood up here but then we've also added some horizontal structures which are just designed to act to not let the water just scour this all away and, and, and nuke it but so that we, there'd be the possibility of some erosion and some uh, you know sinuous channels developing up in here and this is just a, a cross section of the stream before uh, of the area before and after the restoration same idea here in Dalton Creek we're trying to bring heterogeneity back to the area so one it's taking down the taking on the dike and two uh, the philosophy here is to to uh, now now so so there's a lot of sinuosity in salt marsh tidal creeks that that's what should be there over time but leaving it to its own devices can take a while. So one thing we've learned in, in salt marsh restoration is if we want those channels, we, we jumpstart them. So rather than making all the sinuosity ourselves, we start the, the first order and second order you know, branches off of the stream as, as the starter point. And I'll just say that, that that's been very successful. So that's another example of what we can do in our MPAs. We can do active restoration and things of that nature. Uh, next, let's go back to the uh, Pacific and let's talk about some of our Pacific tropical reefs. We can talk about the Philippines uh, uh, marine protected areas. You've done some reading on these. Uh, and uh, basically, the Philippines has a tremendous, you know, it's an island nation with a massive amount of islands, over 7,000 islands comprising the country of the Philippines. And that translates into a huge coastline, about 20,000 uh, uh, 20, kilometers of coast. Um, Two thirds of the population live in those immediate coastal zones. Um, and very high biodiversity. We're, you know, we're near the Coral Triangle here. And uh, they've established on their own more than 500 MPAs in different shapes and forms over the last few decades. Um, they also have a long tradition of historically managing this, as have other small island nations in managing their offshore resources. Um, they established their first national marine park in 1940, and... and uh, that's at the national level, but there's also uh, hundreds of locally created um, um, what we now would consider marine protected areas. One of the biggest concerns uh, in this part of the world is uh, destructive fishing practices. And so on the right, you're seeing somebody doing dynamite fishing, which is a horrible practice where you throw explosives essentially in the water. They blow up and then the, the shockwave, the concussion, the concuss, the fish are concussed usually imploding their, their swim bladders and they are dead and they float to the surface. Then you just fish by going over and picking them up. But obviously that, that massively destroys the reef. And so this, this is an example of an old fisherman and many, many of the older fishermen like are missing a finger or, or whatever, or more like this guy um, because of the danger of working with explosives, doing fishing. Um, I'd say another, another big issue here is also um, uh, cyanide fishing for the aquarium trade where you squirt essentially poison into fish and it makes them stunned for a bit and then you can eat more easily capture them sell them into the aquarium trade uh, those fish usually die if they don't die immediately they usually die within six months of of metal poisoning um, after someone has shipped them back to the united states and people put them in their aquaria or whatever uh, uh, so anyway so a lot lots of destructive practices uh, here on, on the reefs mostly associated with fishing um 
so uh, MPAs in the Philippines are uh, controlled by the uh, Fisheries Code of 1998, which has guidance for uh, the set aside of 15% of locally controlled waters for what they call fish sanctuaries, we call MPAs, um, and 25 to 40% of the fishing areas outside of those tight end coastal waters. Um, and you can think of this as the analogous to us of state waters versus versus federal waters. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah. So so there's guidance for near shore waters and guidance for waters a bit uh, farther offshore. Uh, and there's also been a trend of, of seeking increasing international agreements. So uh, the Philippines has been a, a, a key player in things like the Convention on Biological Diversity, on the ASEAN Convention uh, for Nature and Natural Resources, and so on and so forth, including things like the Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is really important for the Philippines in dealing with China right now, um, and so on and so forth. Um, the challenges have been and remain with Philippine MPAs enforcement and community support. So when the community gets behind an MPA, it works. When they don't get behind the MPA, they don't work at all. And so a couple examples here, um, uh, Sumalon Island, was that MPA was established in 1974, um, but is, has gone through two cycles of being disbanded, and then we reinstate it, and then we disband it, and then we reinstate it. And so it does, uh, the, the data from when we did have it enforced um, did seem to improve fish biomass and fish abundance and yields outside the reserve. But as soon as that, that um, um, MPA was rescinded, that went away. And so this actually turns out to be a really useful experiment because we, we I mean, while it wasn't designed as an experiment, we have an experiment. What happens when we close, you know, when we, when we change fishing pressure, return that fishing pressure, close that fishing pressure, etc. The other one I'll just flag for you is Apo Island, which was established in 1982. And that's a, a, a maybe a classic example uh, of one. The community is really down with it, really um, helps in with enforcement. Um, so a lot of social pressure to, you know, not, not do illegal fishing and that, that nature of stuff. And that, that uh, example MPA seems to be working well. Next, we'll turn to the Great Barrier Reef, the, the mother that got us going, the mothership for our, our large-scale marine protected areas. So the, the Great Barrier Reef, as we're seeing here, it's, it's this sort of um, line of stuff from the satellite view right here. See it closer in. Um, it's, a, it's a chain of reefs um, extending um, from uh, a little bit north of Brisbane uh, up to the, the north of the, the northernmost peak of the terrestrial part of the continent of Australia. It is our largest biogenic structure, the largest thing you can see from space that was created by life. Um, uh, pretty cool. It, it extends more than 2,000 kilometers, more than 2,300 kilometers in, in particular, um, and is comprised of just thousands and thousands of individual reefs. Um, many of them are relatively small, one to 10,000 hectares, um, with many of them being closer to the one uh, hectare in size. Uh, there's, there's coral caves, there's um, uh, more robust islands that would have, you know, palm trees and, and all that kind of good stuff, high relief, et cetera. Um, very high biodiversity. Again, we're near the coral triangle here. So we have some, we have more than 4,000 described species of marine mollusks, more than 400 species of coral more than 1,500 species of marine fish, and more than 242 species of, of seabirds um, in and around the Great Barrier Reef. It is a major part of the Australian identity and also a major part of the Australian economy. So really, really important culturally from Aboriginal peoples who've been on the continent for about 60,000 years contiguously up through um, you know, modern times. Um, even, you know, 30 years ago, they were getting lots and lots of visitors um, to the reef. Um, and, this, and this survey was one of the first big surveys that was done about a decade after the, the robust um, declaration and, and the, the expansion of the barriers uh, and redefining of them in 1981. Uh, and, you know, around that same era, around the turn of the last century, pumping in something on the order of, you know, five to six billion dollars a year um, in, into the uh, tourism, into the national economy, with most of that coming from tourism. So most of that's not selling fish products or something of that nature. Um, uh, 
yeah so the history is it was it was first guarded some protections very little but some in 1903 under the national parks act uh, and then uh, pressure to um, harvest the chunks of um, of calcium carbonate that are the calcium carbonate skeletons of the um, reef uh, to send them to Asia to make cement for housing projects that um, freaked people out and so that got them to rally uh, first rallying and then um, and then that was that proposal was defeated and then a proposal for oil and gas drilling that was defeated and so um, that was those were formally defeated in 1975 with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park which is the again as I mentioned the world's first large-scale MPA um, and the proximate driver again at that time uh, the the coral block mining had been abandoned. It was it was really to deal with proposals for oil and gas extraction. Um, it uh, becomes a World Heritage Area and is is um, increased slightly in 1981, and that's essentially the the core of what we have today. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is a multiple use MPA, and so essentially it's been broken down to a whole variety of uses. So zone, this is marine zoning, again, marine spatial planning, where there's some areas where you can do, you know, just about anything. And there's some areas where you can only do, you know, transit, so on and so forth. And it looks something like this, right? So we have this, this mixture, this is one subsection, but we have this mixture of areas you can do this activity, but not that, et cetera. And that is a hallmark of some of our uh, more um, uh, intensely used uh, marine protected areas. Uh, in those zones, uh, if when you add up all the different things uh, in terms of fishing, about one third of the total area is in one form of an, uh, one form or another that translates into a no take, uh, so no fishing at all area. So one third of the area is no fishing. The Great Barrier Reef has, you know, been experiencing a lot of challenges. So the MPA seems to have worked well to help protect fish species, etc. So we see the, in this case, this is the northern chunk of the Great Barrier Reef. We see the trend here in coral cover, live coral cover. And, and it's been sort of hanging out, you know, fairly, fairly, there's, there's noise to be sure, but it's hanging out in this sort of band from the 1980s to the early 2000s. And then we start to hit this precipitous drop where we're starting to see much more frequent uh, climate change induced coral bleaching. And so we're starting to have a lot of problems with coral bleaching. And so if we look at the most recent uh, report card, uh, where and one of the things Great Barrier Reef does fantastically well is monitoring. A lot of robust monitoring, a lot of fantastic, some of the best coral researchers in the world are Australians, and this is their backyard, and they know this up and down, and they've been doing some fantastic innovation in terms of both monitoring the health of our systems and our MPAs, but also communicating that to the public. So you can go to their website, and you can check out their dashboards and um yeah and so um i'll just uh i'll just quote uh the most recent report and most recent annual report which says most most coral reefs of the great barrier reef demonstrate resilience in the absence of acute disturbances um however as the 2022 mass uh, mass coral bleaching event highlighted and crown of thorns uh, starfish outbreaks uh, coral disease and tropical cyclone Tiffany further emphasized the reefs of the Great Barrier Reef continue to face cumulative stressors. So there's more and more problems every year facing all of these systems. Where we are right now is the Great Barrier Reef is trying to figure out how to innovate and use the strengths of their EPA, of their, of their EPA, geez, of their marine protected area, MPA, in this dynamic world. So in recent years, some of the things, some of the trends I'm just highlighting for you here. Um, and, and I would say as, as the, the Great Barrier Reef MPA oftentimes leads other MPAs because of their sophistication and, 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 um, and advancement in a lot of these areas. When COVID-19 hit, there was this was huge impact on this very tourism dependent area. So the, the year right before COVID, they, they brought in something like $4.3 billion in U.S. dollars, or that was about $6 billion in Australian dollars to Australia, and was directly supporting, so not indirect jobs, but directly supporting over 60,000 jobs um, in the tourism industries. So that could be people working in hotels, that could be people working on dive boats, etc. COVID hits, and global tourism as a whole ramps obviously dramatically down, declines uh, something on the order of 78%. Um, and at that point, and, and 
Australia was one of the places that had one of the most strictest lockdown um, issues. You couldn't even move from from you know Queensland to New South Wales necessarily during during lockdown. So they really were locked down. And so tourism then became um, not international tourism, but local tourism, hyper local tourism. And I'll just say that it, it's it's been a, a mixed bag there. Uh, that some of the data is still coming in, but but um, that led to um, increased recreational pressure, increased fishing pressure in a lot of the areas. But it also led to um, increased enforcement. Um, and so there, it, it's, it's not as if COVID was good for the reef or COVID was bad for the reef. COVID induced just a lot of different pressures um, and a lot of different um, uh, stressors uh, on the reef. Uh, and maybe foretelling things to come with, with changing uh, travel behavior should something like that happen in the future. Um, next, the other uh, big theme here is increasing frequency of coral, coral bleaching events. So uh, we've had four major bleaching events over just seven years, and that's really tough. So um, the coral appears to be recovering somewhat. It's sort of been in a, in a, in a, in a sort of frozen state this last year, but, but it's been recovering somewhat. But it's not all the coral that's been recovering. And we seem to be, lo and so while, while coral has been recovering, or at least is on a trajectory to be recovered, um, the diversity is much lower. So we're not getting all the types of coral that bounce back from these bleaching events, and that's a worry. Um, uh, we're also seeing um, altered systems. And so when, when we've removed a lot of the apex predators and things of that nature, we're seeing altered um, trophic webs across many of our reefs across the planet. And in the case here, it's crown of thorns starfish, actually all across the Pacific. So these are naturally, these are not invasive. These are naturally occurring starfish that are sea stars that are on the reef, but they're normally in low abundance. And it's, this is sort of analogous to our, um, locally to our um, urchin barrens, right? We normally have urchins and they're around, but they're not very abundant. They hang out in their cracks. But then when we hit a, a stressful condition, an El Nino condition or whatever, we'll, they can switch to an urchin barren where they come out and just mow down the kelp. And, and so that's what seems to have happened in many of these stressed reefs around the Pacific is we have these so-called crown of thorn starfish outbreaks where their populations just get this surge and they just munch and these starfish eat the coral. So they consume the coral as one of their um, food sources. They're also, if you, you they, they hurt. If you touch them, you get, it's, it's hard to deal with them. And so, um, so many people have just thrown up their hands and said, we can't do anything. In Australia, they're like, all right, mate, let's take care of them. And so they've, uh, in the case of the Great Barrier Reef, they sort of started a crown of thorns starfish control program. And over the last decade, they've killed 1.1 million crown of thorns starfish over about 700,000 hectares of reef, which is crazy. Um, and uh, just for scale, they've employed 145 people directly in the in the killing. There's also volunteer programs and stuff, but but uh, it, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, there's still a lot more to do. This hasn't solved the crown of thorn starfish problem, but but this shows that when you when you put your attention to it, you can at least begin to make something of a dent on these uh, uh, with these critters. Um, in 2021, the Great Barrier Reef Authority um, released Reef 2050, which is a long-term sustainability plan for the reef. Key to that is, is robust integrated monitoring and reporting so that we can catch some of these problems like bleaching or like um, a crown of thorns outbreak before they get too advanced, hopefully, or disease outbreak, let's say. They also recommend a really, uh, really expanded enforcement. And in, in response to this so far, the Reef Joint Management Program has increased its budget um, and bought new vessels and, and brought in new staff so that they can patrol and enforce some of the rules, a key aspect to any M successful MPA. And then I think one of the most, the neatest ones and the ones that I think most people can learn from is this realization that we have to get out in front of these disturbances, that we can't just wait for the crown of thorns outbreak to happen. We can't just wait for the bleaching event. We need to start to get in front of these things, these stressors, these multiple stressors. And so um, we currently have a Great Barrier Reef blueprint for resilience. But a key aspect of that that I just want to highlight here is that um, some of this includes being okay with doing management actions that we don't know are going to work, right? And doing fairly aggressive management actions. The classic one here would be outplanting strains of coral that we've selected to be more heat tolerant. So introducing into the wild um, uh, not necessarily genetically engineered, but possibly genetically engineered, but more 
more just you know selected for the species or the strains or the subspecies or whatever um, of these uh, coral genomes that have a higher likelihood of withstanding bleaching events. And that's quite controversial because we'll be messing with the, the genetic diversity of the reef and all this kind of stuff. But essentially, this realization um, is, uh, is pushing us to the point where we got to start taking some risks here. And this could be a bad thing. This might end up not working out, but that um, the Australians are, are leading the pack in terms of willing to take a potential hit um, with the possibility of having a much bigger upside and a more resilient coastline. And so MPAs are central to all of these challenges that we've been talking about, and MPAs are an essential tool as we talk about going forward and doing things like um, you know, releasing uh, more resilient versions of species and stuff like that into the wild. As always, the biggest issue here is people, our people, um, and um, uh, we constantly have problems. So we you know, have the deep water horizon and then we have a, um, this, this coal tanker because Australia just loves to keep shipping their coal around the world. Um, and this guy ran aground, and not only is the coal problematic, but all the bunker fuel, etc. So we, we constantly have to manage people, even in these well-protected, even in these fully or highly protective MPAs with all kinds of funding and all kinds of rules. We always need to, it always comes back to managing people.